Hello, my name is uh, Ben Miller, uh, and I'm the in-situ application specialist at GATAN. Uh, today, I'm pleased to introduce uh, Dr. Peter Crozier. Uh, Peter is a professor in the School for Engineering of Matter, Transport, and Energy at Arizona State University. Um, Peter will be talking today about in-situ eels, uh, and he has extensive experience in developing and applying uh, advanced transmission electron microscopy techniques, including eels, uh, to problems related to energy in the environment. Uh, he is currently applying electron energy loss spectroscopy to determine optical and vibrational properties of materials, as well as uh, to monitor catalytic reactions in situ. Uh, Peter serves on the editorial boards of Micron and Microscopy Today and is a fellow of the Microscopy Society of America and uh, currently serves as its treasurer. Um, he's organized numerous workshops, schools, symposia, uh, and is the uh, scientific co-chair of the EDGE meetings, uh, which cover eels. Um, he's published hundreds of uh, journal articles and conference uh, presentations. And so I'm, I'm pleased to uh, introduce him today. Uh, and excited about the uh, presentation he is going to show us today about in situ eels. Um, today we'll uh, be presenting this uh, webinar live uh, to all of you who are listening at the moment. Uh, and so if you have questions, uh, you can submit those through the questions pane, uh, which you can see here. And so during the webinar, I'll be uh, going through the questions that are submitted and, and uh, uh, finding some of the, the best questions to ask to Peter at the end of this talk. Um, and so if you do have questions, uh, we will try to get to them uh, today. So uh, with that, I will uh, hand it over to Peter uh, so that he can present his talk. Okay, well, uh, thank you very much, Ben, for the very kind introduction, and good morning to everyone, wherever you are. Um, um, we are having a nice sunny morning here in Arizona, and um, over the next 45 or so minutes, as Ben said, we're going to talk about electron energy loss spectroscopy and how that can be used to help uh, with your studies uh, using in situ electron microscopy. So what I plan to do over the next uh, 45 minutes is we'll do a very brief uh, introduction to in situ microscopy and maybe an, an environmental transmission electron microscopy. And then a, a brief introduction to eels, just for those of you that may not be so familiar with the technique. Um, and then I'll talk about some of the applications of using eels in in situ type settings. So we'll talk about elemental analysis, which is probably the thing that eels is used the most for. And then we'll talk about how you can get information on chemical changes that might take place during your in situ experiments, so bonding analysis, um, a little bit on analysis of samples in liquid and a little bit about gas analysis. And then finally, um, I'll talk a little bit about valence and vibrational uh, analysis for uh, looking at what's happening on, on surfaces. Um, so starting with the in situ uh, introduction, um, I think that when I think of in situ, I always think that we're looking at a material inside, say, an electron microscope, although in situ, of course, applies to many materials characterization techniques is a fairly hot topic right now. But the idea is if we just focus on electron microscopy, you might have some nanoparticle uh, loaded into the microscope and you might be able to form an image down here on the viewing screen or perhaps a spectrum. And then the idea is that you apply some stimulus to the system that could be electrical bias, it could be light, it could be heat, you could expose the sample to gas or liquid. And in general, the sample will undergo a phase transformation. And so the, the image or the spectrum that you see from the material will change as a result of this in situ uh, environment that you're creating. 
Um, and then very often we're motivated by some sort of materials functionality. So um, at least in my group, when we talk about operando, <coughs> we mean that we're also going to try and measure some change in materials functionality, some performance metric, if you were looking at, say, electrochemical devices like batteries or fuel cells, you might want to look at the IV characteristics of the device. Uh, in my group, we're often looking at catalytic reactions, so we want to measure the reaction product. So the idea is that we're going to sort of um, look at how the material responds uh, in the presence of some sort of stimuli, and we're going to try and identify that that form of the material is the form that's relevant to whatever functionality that I'm interested in. And so you can see uh, catalysis is one area that people use this batteries, it's used in uh, fuel cells, um, and of course the uh, many other areas too that you might be interested in. The Since this morning we're going to focus quite a lot on the gas reaction cells, I just put in a quick summary slide of the two main ways in which you can create uh, gas reaction cells in the transmission electron microscope. They're often called environmental reaction cells. Uh, the, the one that's most common is the so-called windowed cell, and that's where you um, have two thin membranes that can transmit electrons, something like, say, silicon nitride, maybe 10 to 20 nanometers in thickness. And you basically sandwich your sample between these two windows, and then you can flow gas or liquid between those windows in order to create the in situ environment. And uh, there are many different uh, versions of these devices commercially available. They're often heating coils are embedded in the ceramic membranes uh, so that you can heat the sample up. And there are various biasing, the lots of in situ permutation of that. Of that, so so many of you may have one of these uh, windowed cell holders for doing in situ heating in in liquid or gas or biasing. The other uh, less common way of creating a gas environment is the so-called differential pumping approach, uh, which are the methods that we often use here at Arizona State University. Uh, in that case, the sample, so this is just a schematic diagram of the objective lens area of the TEM. This is the upper pole piece and the lower pole piece. The sample sits in between the two pole pieces and the electrons are uh, moving down the column here. And what we basically do is we put differential pumping apertures in the upper and lower bores of the pole pieces and we flow gas into the area that contains the sample and some of that gas leaks through these differential pumping apertures. And we actually drill holes in the upper and lower pole pieces to pump away the extra gas to prevent the gas from getting up to the field emission source. So those are the two main ways in which we can do um, reaction cell uh, measurements in the TEM. And again, I could spend a whole hour just talking about them, but I want to push on to the electron energy loss part of the, of the, the, the lecture. So, Whenever you have a fast electron coming down the microscope column, it will interact with the sample, which is shown here. And as you probably all know, there are many different types of electron uh, solid interactions. Um, one of the common ones, if it's a crystalline sample, is that the electron beam will be elastically scattered to give these diffracted beams. And these uh, diffracted beams are what we would typically use to form, say, a, a phase contrast image. Uh, you can have high angle scattering, thermal or phonon scattering. That might be a signal that you use for so-called Z-contrast stem. Um, but the other thing that can happen is that the electron, the fast electron, can lose energy as it travels through the material, either via excitation of the electrons in the solid or excitation of vibrational modes in the solid. And so those two uh, types of uh, energy loss, often are referred to as inelastic um, scattering. And it's electronic excitation and vibrational excitation processes that are the basis for electron energy loss spectroscopy. Uh, these scattering processes are just illustrated schematically here. So you can have, for example, direct interaction of the electron with the nucleus to give elastic type scattering, that would be 
Bragg scattering, for example, or that uh, interaction can cause the nucleus to oscillate. That would be vibrational or phonon type excitations. Um, or the fast electron can excite, say, one of these inner shell electrons, excite it to a higher energy state. That would be uh, inner shell ionization, core loss spectroscopy, meaning because these are the core electron states. Or the electron can interact with the outer valence electrons, the electrons making up, say, the conduction band, and that would give rise to so-called a low loss or um, valence or plasmon type excitations. And again, the diagram down here is just an energy level representation of some of these excitations. So here would be, uh, for example, deeply bound inner shell levels, the K shell and the S shell corresponding to 1S and uh, 2S or 2P uh, electrons. And of course, those electrons can be excited to unoccupied states above the Fermi level as shown by these arrows here. Uh, that would be an example of this process, inner shell excitation or you can excite the electrons in the valence or conduction band to a state above the Fermi level, um, and that would be illustrated by some of these processes over here. So when the electron is undergoing inelastic scattering uh, uh, and experiencing these losses, the velocity of the electron beam uh, changes, so I may have a monochromatic beam of electrons entering the sample, and then after the electrons have transmitted through the sample, there's going to be a range of different electron energies corresponding to these different energy transfer processes. So the process of making the and recording the electron energy loss spectrum involves the use of a spectrometer, uh, often a magnetic prism spectrometer, and that essentially using just the V cross B Lorentz type interaction, it deflects the electrons through angles that depend on the velocity of the electron. So I'm just showing here uh, three different energy, uh, three different groups of electrons. There would be the blue electrons that have not lost any energy. Uh, there would be the green electrons that have maybe interacted with the conduction of valence band. And then the red group of electrons, which have lost the most electrons, they would they would uh, have interacted with the, the inner shell levels. And so what comes out of the spectrometer is a, a line of intensity, and the position along the line uh, is uh, where the electrons end up, depends on what the electron velocity was. And typically what we'll do is put some sort of CCD detector in the exit plane or the image plane of the spectrometer, that could be indirect or direct exposure uh, detector, and then we get this electron energy loss spectrum. And we often think of the spectrum in terms of three regions, kind of corresponding to the, the regions that are described over here. We have the elastic part of the signal, um, giving rise to what we call the zero loss part of the signal. And then we have uh, vibrational and valence excitations giving rise to the low loss part of the spectrum. And then we have the core loss due to the, the interactions with the inner shells. So I'm just showing you a real spectrum here. This is actually from cerium oxide, just to illustrate these three regions. So we're plotting the intensity of the spectrum. Notice it's a, a log scale here as a function of the energy loss in electron volts. And so you see centered on zero, this very uh, intense so-called zero loss peak corresponding to the elastic interactions or the unscattered electrons. And then uh, a little bit higher in energy, we have the low loss region. Uh, vibrational excitations will typically lie in the region, you know, zero to about 500 milli electron volts. Excitation of valence electrons or excitation of plasmons will lie typically up to maybe 35 electron volts. So you can see some plasmon excitations here. And then going to higher energy losses, we can see uh, so the, the core loss or inner shell excitations. There's a cerium N23 edge, an oxygen K edge, and a cerium M45 edge. And this, for example, the K edge is due to excitations of the, the 1S orbitals in the material and the M shell is due to excitations of uh, 3D type orbitals. So those are the three regions of the spectra, and each region contains useful information about the sample. And so I'm just going to, oh, one other thing that I should say, of course, is when we're doing 
uh, electron energy loss spectroscopy in the microscope, we're always interested in trying to probe the local composition or chemistry. And so we often will uh, run the electron microscope in STEM mode, where we focus the beam down to a small probe, somewhere between one angstrom and 10 angstroms in size. And so the energy loss spectrum that we collect is then going to be associated with this small volume. The volume that you sample depends on the probe size, uh, but it also depends on something called the characteristic excitation distance. And, and that depend, that varies according to which part of the spectrum you're using. So for core loss uh, electrons, you can probe regions down to a few angstroms, so you can really do atomic resolution uh, core loss spectroscopy. For the valence excitation, this excitation distance is more typically, you know, nanometers. And then with the vibrational excitations, uh, that's an ongoing topic of research where you can probe regions that are on the order of a nanometer or probe regions on the order of an angstrom, depending on how you, you set up the experiment. So here are kind of just a quick summary of the three processes for energy loss and the kind of applications you can use. So first of all, if we think about excitation of electrons in the sample, the valence loss part of the spectrum um, or the low loss part of the spectrum, um, that can be used to look at plasmons. So you can do plasmon mapping for plasmonics, band gap determination, uh, looking at defect states, uh, determining, say, optical properties, um, typically uh, in the infrared up to the ultraviolet. And then there's bonding information associated with this part of the spectrum. Uh, moving out to higher energy loss, exciting the inner shell electrons, so 1s, 2p, 3d orbitals, for example. Um, that's the main way of doing localized elemental analysis with eels. Um, so we are able to do atomic resolution elemental mapping. Um, and we can also do high spatial resolution analysis of bonding, say but the bonding at surfaces or the bonding at interfaces. Excitation of phonons or vibrational modes. This is a newer area for eels, just really come onto the scene in the last five years. Um, so people are still exploring that technique. And so certainly uh, we've used that to look at hydrogen detection, uh, organics, mapping different phonon modes and materials, um, isotope tracing, because the, the vibrational modes depend on the mass of the atom. You can think of isotopic type techniques that would not be available to you through electronic excitation. And then I'm not going to talk about this last area, which is the direct creation of photons by the fast electron beam. For those of you that might know, this is things like Cherenkov, uh, guided light modes, etc. But in the interest of time, I'll, I'll skip over that today. So I want to go on to some of the applications now. Um, probably the most important one is elemental analysis. And I'm just going to show a couple of examples over an extended period of time from my own group about how you can use electron energy loss spectroscopy uh, in the context of in situ type of experiments. Um, the first example I'm going to show you is uh, related to material synthesis, a couple of examples. Um, one way in which you can make materials is a technique called electron beam induced deposition, where you put a uh, gaseous precursor into the electron microscope and then you decompose the, the precursor molecules, adsorb onto this some surface, and then when you strike them with the electron beam, uh, the precursor decomposes and you end up depositing material on the sample. Um, the particular experiment that's shown here, we were using a deuterated gallium azide to try and make gallium nitride quantum dots. And so you run the environmental TEM in STEM mode, and you can, you can step the, the beam across the sample, and you can deposit uh, little quantum dots on the order of 10. I think these were about five nanometers in size. And, and in this case, we're doing it onto a reasonably thick um, uh, this was onto a substrate, silicon substrate. And of course, the question is, when you undergo this reaction, are you actually making gallium nitride or are you doing something else? And so here is an example of an electron energy loss spectrum. The substrate was fairly thick, but you can clearly see 
nitrogen at 400 electron volt loss, and then this gallium L23 edge up here above 1000 EV loss. So the EELS is immediately telling me that these uh, dots that I've made contain nitrogen and gallium. And then if we zoom up on the nitrogen edge here, you can see the the so-called near edge fine structure on the gallium on the nitrogen edge, which is completely consistent with the formation of gallium nitride. So that's confirming that we have gallium nitride present um, when we are doing the in situ experiment. Similarly, um, another experiment related to materials processing was we were investigating patterning of silicon nitride membranes and. Um, you can essentially drill holes in these silicon nitride membranes if you change the gas inside the microscope. So in this particular experiment, we were looking at hole drilling, making holes that were about three to four nanometers in size in a, I think it was a 30 nanometer I think silicon nitride membrane. And when you change the gas, you can change the, the types of holes that are formed. And actually what you're looking at over here is the variation in a number of important signals, yield signals, uh, as a function of time during the hole drilling. So the red curve is silicon, the, um, the, the green one is the nitrogen uh, signal. And then interestingly for this particular experiment was the carbon, which was an unintended uh, contribution to the process. But what seems to happen is when the beam is held stationary on the sample, you initially build up some carbon on the sample, and then what happens is uh, you, you you drill a hole through the silicon nitride, and the carbon is immediately sputtered away. So there were some interesting insights into the hole drilling mechanism by following the hole drilling process simultaneously with the eels as a function of time. Another variation in that is if you switch the, the gas in the cell from, say, hydrogen to, to water vapor, uh, then you see a phase transformation where the silicon nitride transforms to silicon oxide. And again, you can follow the dynamics of the transformation process with eels. What we're plotting here with the magenta curve is the nitrogen signal as a function of time during the irradiation with the focus beam in the presence of water. And so you can see that the nitrogen signal is decaying. And then the yellow signal is the oxygen peak, the oxygen uh, K edge, you see that's growing with time. And the silicon drops a little bit, but not by very much. And essentially what this is showing is that we transform from silicon nitride initially to something that's almost uh, predominantly silicon oxide. And I'm showing here just the silicon L23 edge for those of you that might be familiar with the near edge fine structure in silicon. If you look at the change in the shape of the silicon edge, you can also see uh, that there's a significant change between the initial and final shapes, which is consistent with the formation of silicon oxide. And you can then, of course, map in situ at the same time. This is elemental maps uh, from an energy filter uh, where we're looking again at a periodic array of these silicon oxide uh, plugs, if you will, that are formed in the silicon nitride. And here's uh, just a superposition of the oxygen and nitrogen elemental maps that again can be recorded in situ while you're doing your experiment. So that's an example of materials, um, you know, patterning materials. We're very interested in catalytic materials in my group and in particular bimetallic catalysts are um, systems that are of great interest and importance. And so I'm just showing you we're, in this particular work, we were actually making the bimetallic particles inside the electron microscope. Um, so if you look at this, it's an annular dark field image recorded in the, the stem. Um, and we're depositing ruthenium and cobalt onto, it was gamma alumina. You can see maybe these little needles of uh, aluminum oxide. And the precursors for forming the ruthenium and cobalt particles were cobalt nitrate and ruthenium chloride. So you simply impregnate the gamma alumina powder with these two aqueous solutions. And then you load it into the electron microscope and then you start heating in hydrogen. So we're heating a mixture of hydrogen and nitrogen here. So this stem image is recorded at 400 degrees in a hydrogen atmosphere. And then of course we want to know whether we've made our ruthenium and cobalt nanoparticles. There's a lot of complex chemistry that can go on here. And so you can see these particles that are formed, they tend to form these aggregates of particles. And if you go in with the stem probe, 
you can record energy loss spectra from particles of different sizes. And so here's the yield spectrum recorded at 400 degrees in hydrogen. Um, you can see cobalt over here at about 775. So some of the particles do indeed contain cobalt. Some of the particles contain ruthenium. It's a little bit hard to see here, but buried under all these arrows is the ruthenium M edge at around about 330 electron volts. Uh, so we have, um, what's interesting is we have pure ruthenium particles. The oxygen, by the way, is coming from the, the gamma alumina support. So we have pure ruthenium particles. We have pure, turns out to be cobalt oxide particles. If you look at the oxygen K edge here, you see there's actually a little pre-peak there, which is associated with the oxygen bonded to cobalt. So that allows us to differentiate oxygen bonded to cobalt from say oxygen bonded to alumina. And then uh, some of the particles, the very small ones, um, contain cobalt and ruthenium. And so by combining these different in situ processing techniques with high spatial resolution yields, you're able to look at these different types of bimetallic particles that form under different types of reaction conditions. Um, of course, we're also interested in actually looking at the structure reactivity relations of these bimetallic uh, particles when they're actually doing chemical reactions. So in this particular example, we were looking at a ruthenium nickel bimetallic system, and we were using that uh, catalyst to, to do um, reforming of hydrocarbons. So this, uh, for you take hydrocarbon and you create hydrogen and carbon monoxide from it. This particular reaction is called partial oxidation of methane. We react methane with, with oxygen, and we make uh, CO and H2. Now, when you're doing in situ experiments, of course, it's always important to, first of all, run the experiments ex situ and then compare the ex situ observations with the in situ observations. So here is uh, reactor data for this particular reaction here. And I, I understand that um, this is not a catalysis webinar, so I don't want to spend too much time on this. But I just want that this solid um, curve that you see here is the amount of methane that is consumed. And so we're essentially plotting the consumption of methane as a function of temperature in the reactor here. And I just want to point out two things. Something, the catalyst turns on, if you will, at around about 400 degrees. So you can see that the, the, there's no methane consumption before 400 degrees. So something has happened that's caused the catalyst to turn on. And then there's another change in the gradient of that curve there, which um, actually corresponds to complete consumption of all the oxygen in the, re the reactor. This is the oxygen. A conversion and so you can see that all the oxygen is consumed it's converted to something else and that causes a change in the methane conversion so we were interested in trying to simulate these reaction conditions inside the electron microscope we wanted to know what happened to the catalyst at 400 degrees in the presence of methane and oxygen and then we wanted to know what also happened to the catalyst uh, when the oxygen is completely consumed so here's just a couple of bright field TM images. Um, uh, first of all, imaging in hydrogen. When you're working on cat metal catalysts, you often reduce in hydrogen to put the surface of the nanoparticle into a reasonably well-defined metallic state. And then we, when we introduce the two reactant gases, which in this case are oxygen and um, methane, you immediately see a phase change. So the particle starts to show a change, and you see the formation of this core shell type of structure. So um, by doing EELS line scans uh, under these in situ conditions, you can sort of explore what's happening to this uh, particle under a variety of different reaction conditions. So what we're doing here is we're scanning the electron beam across this little bimetallic nanoparticle. So here's a typical spectrum that we see. Uh, nickel is located at 855. This is the nickel. L23 edge, and then we have ruthenium down here again at around about 300. And so these spectra are recorded in hydrogen at 400 degrees. And if I process the yield spectra to extract the nickel and ruthenium signals, then I can plot the variation in the strength of the nickel and ruthenium signal across the particle. And so we're doing a line scan here, starting out in the vacuum. That's this part here. Scanning in, and the solid line is the nickel profile. 
and the dotted line is the ruthenium profile. And notice the two profiles approximately follow each other, which is what we would expect if we had sort of uniform alloying um, between the two metals and the particle. Now, once you let in methane and oxygen, and we, saw, we get this core shell forming, you see a big change in the energy loss spectrum. So immediately we see that oxygen has reacted with the particle and we have oxides present now. And then if you do the same line scan, you see now that the nickel profile and the ruthenium profile no longer superimpose, and that's consistent with the formation of an oxide shell, predominantly nickel oxide shell, around uh, a ruthenium core, as shown here. So the particle has phase separated, and the EELS has allowed us to investigate that phase separation. And then if I want to look at the next phase change that occurs when, when, the, when the environment is depleted of oxygen, so here's just another particle, again, showing a core shell structure here. And if I now reduce the oxygen partial pressure in the reaction cell, I can follow the evolution of the composition of that particle. So here we're now, this is exactly the same particle, um, at 600 degrees now, where we've reduced the oxygen partial pressure down to almost zero. And here is my line scan again. And if you compare the profiles now, you can see that I no longer have this simple core shell structure that I had here that the two metals are now sort of mixed together, but they're not mixed together in the way that the initial state was. So they don't, it doesn't look like a uniform alloy anymore. You've got sort of compositional heterogeneity in the nanoparticle and that, so essentially that even though there's no oxide present there, the structure of this particle is completely different from the initial structure here. And so for these kind of experiments, we often superimpose the structure of the particle back onto the catalytic data, so we can say that uh, we start off with a uniform nickel ruthenium alloy at about 400 degrees. There's a phase change resulting in a core, the formation of a core shell type of uh, structure. Um, the mechanism there is, is a Kirkendall type mechanism. And then as we go up to five or 600 degrees, the system uh, reduces again, the oxides reduce, and I end up with this um, compositionally heterogeneous uh, form of the catalyst, and that's what's actually producing the hydrogen in, in this particular reaction. Um, let me just check my time here. So let's talk about bonding now. That was elemental analysis. Let's talk about how I can get information on the chemical bonds, because when I'm doing these kind of in situ, especially the in situ experiments in the reaction cell, the chemistry of the material is changing. And so again, I'm going to focus on showing some examples from reducible oxides, uh, cerium-based oxides. So you'll all have cerium-based oxides in your catalytic converter of your car. And what happens in a lot of uh, applications, catalytic or membrane, uh, fuel cell type applications that involve reducible oxides, um, part of the functionality of these materials is associated with the ability of these materials to create and annihilate oxygen vacancies. So when you change the gas ambient or the temperature, um, here's an example, just a schematic diagram of the, a unit cell of uh, cerium oxide. If I introduce a reducing environment, then what happens is the oxygen from the lattice can leave the material and introduce an oxygen vacancy. So you've constantly got oxygen going in and out of the crystal structure, um, for example, in your catalytic converter during oxygen lean, lean and oxygen rich parts of the cycle, uh, the, this composition of the cerium oxide is changing. And notice that, that when this reaction occurs, when you create or annihilate oxygen vacancies, uh, the ceria cations change their oxidation state. And um, electron energy loss spectroscopy is quite sensitive to changes in oxidation state, as shown here. So here's the cerium M45 edge, um, showing uh, what the spectrum looks like in, at room temperature in a hydro hydrogen atmosphere. And then if we heat the material up to 700 degrees, you see a change in the relative intensity of the M5 and the M4 lines, uh, that's because the cerium has reacted with hydrogen and we've uh, introduced a lot of oxygen vacancies into to, to the cerium. So by monitoring these so-called white lines in the energy loss spectrum, 
we are able to get information about the creation and annihilation of oxygen vacancies inside the oxide. And then, of course, when we change the conditions inside the microscope, we can monitor the behavior of the oxygen vacancies. So here's an example, again, of a cerium oxide nanoparticle. This is a high resolution image recorded at 600 degrees in hydrogen. And this is the corresponding electron diffraction pattern, and this is the electron energy loss spectrum. And then if we go from 600 degrees uh, up to 700 degrees, you see a big change in both the image, the diffraction, and the yield spectrum. You see these coarse, uh, uh, larger period fringes, so-called super lattice fringes that are forming here. And, um, and you can see additional reflections appearing in the, um, the diffraction pattern, and again, you see the change in the white line intensity in the cerium M45 edge. So this is telling me that oxygen vacancies are present at 700 degrees, and the image and diffraction information is telling me that the oxygen vacancies have ordered to form a super lattice structure. And what's interesting about this is this is a reversible process. So I'm just showing a couple of images here uh, where we keep the hydrogen atmosphere constant and we go from 735 degrees where you see the ordered oxygen vacancies down to 722 degrees where the, the ordering disappears and if you just cycle the temperature by plus or minus 15 degrees uh, you can see these structures forming and, and uh, uh, disappearing all the time it's kind of quite interesting so small changes in the oxygen chemical potential are causing uh, an exchange of large quantities of oxygen between the crystal interior and the surrounding gas ambient. So this is the so-called oxygen exchange process, oxygen exchange functionality that's associated with a lot of these kind of materials. Um, in the catalytic converter, for example, you actually have an alloy of a solid solution of Syria zirconia, and you can use in-situ eels to monitor the redox activity of those um, nanoparticles. So how easy can those um, nanoparticles change their oxidation state? So this was kind of an interesting experiment where we've got two uh, nanoparticles of Syria zirconia in the microscope right beside each other. These two particles were literally, you know, 50, 100 nanometers away. Um, so they both see exactly the same temperature and exactly the same gas environment. And what we did was we heated the particles up, we were running them through so-called redox cycles where we heat and cool. So I'm just showing you the cerium oxidation state for this particle here. We start at about oxidation state of four. And then as I heat from about 500 degrees up to 580 degrees, you can see that this particle has undergone reduction and the cerium oxidation state is now about three. Interestingly, the one just along the grid bar, uh, 50 nanometers away, shows very different behavior it doesn't change its oxidation state by nearly as much. It's much less redox active. And so the question was, why are these nanoparticles behaving so differently? Nominally, they should be the same. But of course, when you try to make solid solution nanoparticles, there's always variations in the composition. And so what we're plotting here, again, I don't have time to go into all the details, we're plotting the particle activity as a function of the particle composition. And the most redox active particles are the ones that contain about 30% ceria. The ones that are less redox active are the ones that contain about 50% ceria. And what tends to happen is the ones that contain 50% uh, equal in numbers of ceria and zirconia, when they are subjected to a reducing atmosphere, there's a phase transformation where the crystal structure transforms from a fluorite type phase to a pyrochlor type phase and the pyrochlor type phase is not redox active so we're able to again put we're combining in situ imaging chemical analysis to identify oxygen vacancy creation and composition elemental analysis to identify the seria to zirconia uh, ratio um, one more example is, again, from reforming when you're trying to react hydrocarbons with, say, oxygen. Sometimes you end up, um, if you're slightly depleted of oxygen, you end up forming carbon layers and you deactivate your catalyst. And so uh, Ethan Lawrence was recently looking into this to try and investigate if we could use these um, 
reducible oxides like ceria to perhaps inhibit the formation of uh, carbonaceous layers by using the stored oxygen in the ceria to buffer the oxygen partial pressure in the reaction. And so here's an example. He was looking at a nickel on ceria catalyst, and you can see um, you can get very dramatic carbon depositions going on here. This is a nickel particle. Um, and this is graphite that you see after exposing the material to um, uh, to ethane. And if you you know, for example, if you're thinking of natural gas, natural gas is composed mainly of methane uh, and, and ethane. And so we were interested in looking at the carbon formation processes of these different component gases. So Ethan found that these C2 uh, molecules, either ethane or ethane, were responsible for far more carbon deposition than, say, the methane. And so we decided to do an in situ experiment to try and investigate that a little bit more. So this is showing nickel on cerium oxide at 400 degrees in hydrogen, uh, two different nickel particles. And then we expose this one to uh, C2H4, that's the doubly bonded C2 molecule, and you immediately see the formation of these graphene sheets. Uh, when you go to 500 degrees in C2H4. Um, if you do exactly the same experiment in C2H6, uh, you don't see any graphite formation at all, but you do see disorder introduced to the ceria layer down here. And so we were hypothesizing that the disorder that we see here is because oxygen has been removed from the ceria in order to oxidize any carbon species that might uh, be present on the, the nickel. So Ethan analyzed in situ the interface between the nickel particles and the ceria. So these were ceria cubes with nickel particles on them. And you can put the stem yields probe onto the interface. And for example, here's the stem yield spectra you get from the interface in 400 degrees in hydrogen. And, and then you can do, you can let the other two gases in uh, and, and you can look at what happens at the interfacial region of the ceria. And if you compare the shape of the cerium M45 edge, in this case, in this case, you see that there's a difference. And in fact, this experiment, which is done in C2H6, is consistent with the idea that we've got reduction of ceria in this particular gas. And we knew that this was due to a interaction, a so-called spillover effect, where you have interactions of the gas with the nickel, and then you have those Adsorbed species spilling onto the, the ceria. And so Ethan has done a line scan from the center of the ceria particle right up to the interface with the nickel and plotted the oxidation state. And the important thing is that away from the nickel particle, the oxidation state is always roughly four. But as you approach the nickel particle in the C2H6 environment, you see this significant reduction that has taken place. So there's a localized reduction zone formed around the nickel particle in the ceria, but it depends on the gas composition. It doesn't form in the presence of hydrogen, and it's not very strong in the presence of C2H4, but there's a large reduction zone in the presence of, um, of uh, methane. Um, maybe I won't talk about this particular slide. If you're interested in this work, it was published last year in uh, this uh, ACS Applied uh, Nanomaterials Journal, and you can read about the interpretation of the experiment. But essentially, uh, when you're doing the experiments in C2H6, the carbon formation on the nickel particle is suppressed because you are indeed getting contributions. You're getting oxygen contributed to the adsorbates and they oxidize the carbon and prevent the formation of graphene. Whereas when you have the C2H4 uh, molecule, it reacts very strongly with the nickel and it forms graphene uh, before it has any chance for any of the fragments to diffuse down to the, to the cerium oxide. Moving on, uh, liquid phase analysis. Um, and just a couple of slides from liquids, about five minutes. So here's just some work from uh, Robert Clee's group in Chicago. They were looking at uh, ferritin surrounded with protein shells using a, a membrane reactor, a graphene membrane reactor. And so you can see uh, here, if they put the stem probe onto this little dot, you can see the uh, presence of iron and oxygen showing that ferritin is present. Another example uh, from Megan Holtz at Cornell, she was looking at cathode materials, lithium iron phosphate, and in this particular example, 
uh, when you delithiate the uh, cathode material, you see the formation of this small peak at about five electron volts energy loss. And so she was able to form images. Here's the image formed with the elastic scattering, and here's the energy filtered image formed with this five uh, electron volt peak. And so you can see this particular nanoparticle here would be delithiated according to the EELS analysis. And then of course you can cycle this in situ by charging and discharging and you see changes in the contrast of this energy filtered uh, image telling me where uh, delithiation is occurring as I go through charge and discharge cycles. We can also use EELS to analyze gas Comp uh, compositions inside reaction cells. So here's just an eel spectrum from carbon monoxide. This is the low loss eel spectrum showing peaks associated with exciting the outer shell electrons of the carbon monoxide ox uh, molecule. And then here's the ionization inner shell X uh, spectrum showing the carbon K edge and the oxygen K edge uh, that you would expect to see from, from carbon monoxide. And so you can use eels to analyze the composition of the gas. Uh, and so here we're just showing, for example, doing a CO oxidation experiment where we convert carbon monoxide to carbon dioxide with oxygen, where we initially start off with just pure CO. And as I start to form carbon dioxide, I see a second peak appearing uh, at higher in energy than the first peak uh, corresponding to the three EV shift between the carbon K edge for carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide. And I think you can do the same thing with low loss eels. I think I'll skip over this slide because I, the moderator is telling me I have five minutes left. Um, but basically what we often do when we're trying to look at operando catalytic reaction experiments is we combine gas analysis. We do the gas analysis with eels and with uh, mass spectrometry. So this is an experiment actually from our moderator, Ben Miller, looking at CO oxidation in over a ruthenium catalyst and the mass spectrometer is telling us about the conversion. So you can see the CO2 signal increases and the CO signal decreases as we convert carbon monoxide to carbon dioxide. And then we use the eels also to monitor the gas composition because we're able to quantify the eels. So we typically do quantification of the gas with uh, eels and we use the mass spectrometer as a qualitative continuous measure of what's happening inside the reaction cell. So maybe in the last two or three minutes, um, I just want to mention a little bit about the use of valence and vibrational loss for surface analysis. And I have to say that this is so far not really in situ, but it's kind of new developments in the field that I just wanted to sort of share with you. And, um, and the way that you can use these uh, eels, to, one way you can use eels to do surface analysis is to, rather than pass the beam directly through the sample, you could, you can actually, which is what's shown here, you can run the experiment in what's called the aloof beam uh, geometry. And so the idea here is here's my TEM sample, and I put, position my stem probe outside the sample, typically, you know, five nanometers outside the sample. And because the valence loss and vibrational loss excitation distances are quite large, even when my beam is a few nanometers outside the sample, I can still get an electron energy loss spectrum. And the advantage of this so-called aloof beam geometry is because the beam doesn't directly pass through the sample, I can reduce radiation damage. So there's no direct knock-on damage in this type of geometry. And radiolytic damage is substantially reduced uh, because the ionizations of the uh, material are, are also reduced. So here's just an example of radiation damage being controlled. Um, uh, this is a couple of spectra from calcium hydroxide, which is very beam sensitive. Uh, the red spectrum here is the spectrum you get when you position the beam inside the sample. And the blue spectrum is the, the spectrum you get when you position the beam just six nanometers outside the sample. And even though there are there are you know changes in the scattering mechanism when the beam is inside and outside the sample, the main differences that you see here are associated with radiation damage. The blue spectrum is essentially the undamaged material, showing prominent peaks at 7.3 and 8.4 electron volts here. And once you put the electron beam onto the material, 
uh, the hydroxyl species are completely changed and you end up getting, uh, you lose these peak peaks. And you'll also notice this tailing into the band gap. This is point defects that are created as a consequence of the radiation damage which are showing up, which are absent in the aloof beam spectrum. We can use that to analyze other beam sensitive materials, for example, carbon nitride, work being done by Diane Haber, and it's an important photocatalyst, where we're very interested in identifying where the hydrogen is located in the material. And so here you can see uh, aloof beam eels being used to detect carbon nitrogen vibrational uh, ring modes, and these amine groups are about uh, 350 to 400 MeV loss here. Um, should I? Okay, the moderator is telling me I should probably move to the end. I'll uh, make these slides available. Here's just another example looking at uh, hydration of the surface of magnesium oxide where we're able to detect the presence of water using the vibrational spectrum or the valence loss spectrum. And actually, I think that was in fact my last slide. So, so Ben is going to take okay. over and moderate the questions now. Yes, yeah. So thank you so much, Peter, for that uh, very nice talk and uh, very uh, instructive. Um, so we've gotten a number of questions already submitted online. Um, if you have additional questions, Did I, oh, yeah. um, if you have additional questions, then uh, you can still submit them. Uh, and we may or may not get to all the questions today. Um, but I'll be providing Peter with a, a full list of the questions that were submitted today. Uh, so even if your question wasn't answered live, um, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll still have uh, a chance to uh, look at those. Um, so uh, let me ask uh, just a couple of the questions that have already come in today. Um, First, uh, can you differentiate between different types of hydrocarbons via the carbon K edge? Um, so the answer is, in principle, you can, because the near edge fine structure will change. The challenge with hydrocarbons is that they are very beam sensitive. So experiments that we've done and other people have done over the years um, indicate that it's very challenging to do that with transmission eels. Uh, we've uh, People have compared, say, the carbon K-edge from the scanning X-ray microscope with the carbon K-edges you get from the scanning electron microscope, and they're often quite different. So depending on how beam sensitive your materials are, sometimes it can work. Uh, it, it just depends on the hydrocarbons you're using. I would say that the aloof beam approach that I mentioned at the end, if there are characteristic features in the low loss part of the spectrum, then you may also be able to rely on aloof beam techniques to differentiate between different hydrocarbons using either the valence loss part of the spectrum right now or perhaps the vibrational part of the spectrum. All right, thanks. Um, so uh, another question here. Uh, is there a concentration limit for detecting gases with eels? The answer to that is that the detectability, at least on Earth systems, uh, typically we can go down to maybe about 1%. Again, the sensitivity and the detectability depends on the shapes of the edges. So if you're using, for example, the valence loss, it depends on how much you know you would like to have sharp features in the valence loss. Or if you're using, say, the carbon edge, things like carbon monoxide have very, very sharp pi star peaks. So that goes in your favor of detecting low concentrations of gases. So I would say it with the the old detector, I have to say, on our in-situ microscope, our detector is quite old. Um, we're probably limited to about 1%. If you consider going to these new direct exposure cameras, then I think you can push that down, uh, certainly on order of magnitude. And so the answer really is that it depends on how good your detector is. If you think of doing gas analysis, the gas is moving in and out of the electron beam all the time, and the radiation damage might not be so much. So you can count for a long, long time. You don't have to worry about drift. Um, so you can count for a long time. So it really comes back to how good your detector is. So I would say that for those of you that might have um, 
very high quality electron detectors at the back of your spectrometer, I would imagine you could go substantially below 1%. Thanks. Um, also, do you suggest using EELs in TEM mode or STEM mode? How are they different in terms of resolution and efficiency? I have a bias in favor of STEM. Um, I, I just think that if you're interested in doing EELs analysis of a local area, um, usually we just put the microscope into STEM mode. In terms of in situ characterization, um, radiation damage effects can often be worse in the presence of gas. And so, for example, the hole drilling experiment that I showed you in silicon nitride, um, if I have no gas present, I can't drill holes in silicon nitride. If I put hydrogen or nitrogen in, then I start to drill holes. So one reason why I may not want to do STEM uh, analysis and, and go to say eels of TM is because I'm concerned about radiation damage and by spreading the beam out I can reduce the radiation damage but of course when I do that I also give up spatial resolution. Okay. Uh, another question that's just come in why would you use eels uh, rather than uh, like a synchrotron x-ray technique now that synchrotron techniques are, uh, the spatial resolution is increasing? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so at the moment, the synchrotron techniques, um, if you go to the best, uh, say, scanning um, X-ray microscopes, that typically you can get 10 nanometer spatial resolution. And so, so certainly that's a powerful capability, and many people do use that. However, um, if you want to go below uh, if you want to go down to a nanometer or less, then you, you pretty well ha or still have to use the electron-based techniques. And I don't see that changing anytime soon. And certainly, um, pushing to atomic resolution, I don't see any uh, prospects anytime soon of X-rays giving atomic resolution. Okay. Uh, have you looked at any vibrational signals while using a uh, windowed cell environmental holder and does the silicon and nitride in the membrane significantly affect the signal? Um, that's a good question. We've not done those experiments. We don't have the cell, although the cells are now being uh, manufactured, as, as some of you may know. And so that's a very exciting avenue of research. And there are going to be lots of interesting questions there. So um, the vibrational spectrum is going to come not just from the sample that you're interested in but of course from the the the, the windows uh, and so you have to make sure that there's not overlap between the vibrational modes of say the silicon nitride and the sample you're looking at and then the additional complication of course is when you have gas present is you'll also pick up the vibrational spectrum from the gas so i would say at the moment that's an area that we really need to do a lot of research on in order to sort of unscramble all those factors. And I don't think it's, I mean, I would be hopeful that in the future we could do vibrational spectroscopy of adsorbates on nanoparticles in much the same way as we would use, say, diffuse uh, reflectance infrared spectroscopy to analyze adsorbates on nanoparticle surfaces. But certainly there are many, many technical challenges that we have to overcome first to come to a conclusion about how feasible those kind of experiments are. All right, um, another question here. Uh, how can you determine the valence electron density of a crystalline alloy from eels? Um, can you do that, and if so, how? So one way in which people have tried to determine the density of valence electrons is by using the plasmon excitation. So if you read up on you know basic theory of plasmons, we often say that the plasma resonance energy depends on the density of electrons in the conduction band. And so when you change the electron density in the conduction band, you see a shift in the energy of the plasmon. And so certainly for metallic cases, um, there's been quite a lot that has actually worked on quite a long time ago where people were able to use plasmon shifts to look at, say, uh, changes in alloy composition because the, the, when you change the alloy composition, you change the electron density. So there are papers on that, and so I think that would be, and people have used that technique and they use it today. So I would, I would 
say that that would be one potential uh, strategy to look into. All right, and uh, so there are quite a number of questions and still more coming in, and unfortunately, we won't have time to get to all of them. Uh, but one last question, uh, can you accurately determine the band gap of materials using eels, and uh, are there resources you could recommend on uh, how to do that? A great question. Um, and so if you can keep the electron beam energy fairly low, so if you look back in the slide, I skipped over one of the energy transfer mechanisms, the mechanism where the electron beam makes uh, photons directly. So, so if you can control uh, so-called Cherenkov radiation effects, and if you have a direct band gap material, then you can you can make a measurement of the band gap, and we've done it, and other people have done that. If you have an indirect gap material, um, you need to be a little bit more careful because you might pick up both the, the, the absorption associated with the direct gap might be quite a bit weaker than the absorption associated with the indirect gap. So again, it's really a signal to noise issue. If you look at, say, silicon, which is a band gap of 1.1 uh, um, electron volts, you often will not measure that in a Niels experiment. We've done a lot of work on oxides, and we usually find that we get a pretty reasonable estimate of the band gap there, um, partly because uh, we don't have a, a lot of Cherenkov and we don't have a lot of these other complicated effects. But the answer is you can do it. Um, you need to be aware of potential pitfalls associated, as, it, as I say, things like um, Cherenkov radiation. The other thing to watch out for is so-called cavity modes or guided light modes, which can also give intensity in the band gap region that can be easily misinterpreted as, say, uh, defect states. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Peter. Um, again, wish that uh, we could go through a lot more questions. There are many more that were submitted today. Um, thank you all for uh, attending this webinar. And um, just a reminder, this recording of this webinar will be available uh, on the GATAN website uh, within five business days from today. Uh, so if you miss something or, or you want to go back and, and hear something again, or you want to share this with someone else, uh, you can uh, do that next week. We'll have that available online. So uh, thank you again to those of you who listened, and, and thank you to Peter.